trouble fully showing up for the commitment at hand because of the distractions coming up. We can all say we had good intentions saying yes to something new, but when you could have showed up and meant it in the way that you wanted to, you feel even worse on top of being overwhelmed. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 37, it says, simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Today, I welcome you to sit and listen as I read the lyrics to the song, Trust God by Elevation Worship. As I'm reading, I pray your eyes would be open to the Lord, that you could sit and take in the wonder and power that our Lord has to change our circumstances every day to point to him. The lyrics say this. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire every time. Born of his spirit and washed in his blood, what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. Oh, I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I know the author of tomorrow has ordered my steps. So this is my story and this is my song, and I'm praising the risen King and Savior all the day long. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He didn't fail you then, and he won't fail you now. This is the bridge of the song, and this is what holds the most meaning for me. It says, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. Because I trust him. Because he will never fail. I don't know what the Lord is trying to speak to you today. I don't know what kind of situation you're in, but I know it can feel heavy. I know it can feel like no one understands. I know it can feel like the Lord is not there. It may feel like he hasn't shown up, that he might have forgotten about you. But the question I want to ask you is this, did you forget about God? This may be the reason God hasn't answered your prayer yet, because you haven't sat down with him one-on-one -on -one to let your hands be wide open to all that he has to give you. I'm grateful today that Jesus not only gives us the principle, but he also shows us the way. His life is full of times of wisely saying yes or no, and as we read his word, we learn from him how to create good boundaries for our lives. On top of showing us his example, he also has the power to help us when we stumble and fall. It's the reason he went to the cross. He didn't negotiate with the Lord about dying for our sins. He prayed to his father, if this is what is supposed to happen, father, I trust you all the way. He didn't go back and forth saying, yeah, I'll go die on the cross, or maybe I won't, maybe I will. That wasn't Jesus, and that's not the Lord. Jesus said yes to dying to save us. The Lord said, yes, I will love you unconditionally. Today, I pray the Lord would reveal to you the things that you should be saying yes to, and maybe the things you should be saying no to. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, on the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink from it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I pray for myself and for you today that we would follow his beautiful example. That when we forget or in the moments we mean well but get wrong, we would run into the arms of our Savior, who can wrap us up in love and help help us take the next wise steps. I pray we would be wise with our words and with our time. God, we pray that you would teach us to draw good boundaries and help us learn that saying no to more can often be the most loving thing we can do. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Don't you always feel challenged when Olivia serves communion? <laughs> You're just supposed to get up here and serve communion, Olivia. You're not supposed to, you know, challenge us. Um, <clears throat> today, we've been in the midst of a series uh, for the last couple of weeks, and uh, didn't Phil do really well last week? Did anybody glean anything out of that? Wow, what an encouraging group today. This is great. Wow, I feel... Oh, okay, kids, you can be dismissed. Okay, now, did you feel encouraged last week? Wow, 
It's amazing. I know where to come when I need encouraged. It's Grace Community. <clears throat> Didn't Phil do really well last week? Did you glean anything out of that? Wow. Unbelievable. Well, uh, so the last two weeks we've been talking about physical health, and now we're going to move into financial health. And uh, I've asked uh, a friend to come. His name is Stephen Lester. Uh, he works for the Nazarene um, Foundation, and he can probably tell us a little bit more about that. But uh, Steve is an, an, uh, Stephen is an Olivet grad and uh, a, a seminary grad from uh, Nazarene Theological Seminary, and he's been a pastor for over 30 years um, somewhere here in Illinois. Where, where at in Illinois? Oh, at Peoria, at, at Peoria First Church. Very good. And so uh, it's been, been a little bit of here, there, and everywhere, and so uh, he's going to share with us today, and so if you would welcome him uh, and give him your undivided attention, it would be great. system went out at Chalfin Hall. If you're old enough to remember the music at Chalfin Hall. And, uh, I happened to be up that day. And, uh, so with me, what's up? All right. And um, <laughs> the beauty of it is, you know, I didn't need this amplification system. I was able to read scripture quite loudly. Hey, take the word of God. Go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to read it out of uh, the message. You're going to see it behind me. Matthew chapter 6. I want to talk till death do his part. Do you realize the thing that kills intimacy in relationships is when we don't know how to handle money? You know, the Word of God is filled with more promises about money than heaven and hell combined. Did you know that? God doesn't want you to get deceived by the things that he blesses your life with. So the Word of God has Scripture after Scripture how he wants us to handle his money that he has blessed us with. Make sure you understand God blesses us, his children, not to increase our standard of living, but to increase our standard of giving. And everybody said, amen. Here's what it says in Matthew chapter 6. And again, I'm going to read it out of the message. It says this, don't hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths, Corroded by rust, or worse, stolen by burglars. Let me ask you, how many of you had something stolen? Feel violated? Uh, I remember one of the most times I felt violated, I had a Suzuki Samurai, 1988. I worked downtown, Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, it was a soft top uh, vehicle. And I remember after coming at work, I got in my vehicle and I noticed my radio was missing. Stole my radio and stole my uh, briefcase. Yeah, religion majors used to carry those things at one time before backpacks became popular. And you know the only thing I had in my briefcase? My wife had gotten me this Bible for our marriage, which I used as my study Bible. The only thing I had in that, that case was uh, notes from seminary. Could you imagine their surprise? 
when they opened that up and all they saw was a Bible and seminary notes. Here's what I'm hoping. When I get to heaven, someone looks me up and says, hey, I'm the guy who stole your Bible and got saved by reading your Bible. That's what I'm hoping for. But he says things in this earth can be stolen. So he says, I want you to invest, but not here. He says, your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body becomes a musty cellar. If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you have. Greedy people live dark lives. Generous people live vibrant lives. You can't worship two gods at one time. Loving one God, you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You cannot worship God and money both. God's Word has a lot to say about money. We're going to look at the wisest, wealthiest fellow who ever lived. His name is King Solomon. And I'm going to give you five principles from the Word of God that will help you handle your finances in such a way that they will be a blessing to you and not a burden to you. Proverbs 27, 23 says this, Be sure to know the condition of your flocks. He's talking to shepherds. Give careful attention to your herds, for riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secure for all generations. He says if you're going to have good biblical stewardship, he says the first thing I need you to do is to keep good records. There's got to be an accounting for what's going on in your life. Know the condition of your flocks. You know the best investment I made in 2022? I got a dozen laying hens. How many of you remember that there was a time period where eggs were five, six, seven dollars a dozen? Anybody remember those days? Yeah. So in 2022, I bought me a dozen laying hens. And so I get about nine, ten eggs a day. I know the condition of my flocks. And when I know the condition of my flocks, I can anticipate what my flocks is going to produce. I'm amazed how many people have no financial intimacy with their spouse or have no financial intimacy with themselves. You have to be honest where you're at and ask God for help. People say, I just don't know where my money goes. Where does it all go? Someone said money used to talk. Now it just silently walks away. How many of you have more month at the end of the month than you have money sometimes? Anybody like that? Here's what happens in our culture. The Bible says, get the facts at any price. Proverbs 24, 3 and 4 says, any enterprise becomes strong through common sense and profits by keeping abreast of the facts. So law number one is keep good records. you got to be honest where you're at. If you want to sit down and deal with the stress that money can cause in your life, here's four things you have to do. Write these down. Number one is this. You need to know what you own. Just get down, make a list, lay out your assets. What do you actually own? And not only what you own, but perhaps what you also owe. You know, it's nice to have a home. I have a home, but I know how much I paid for that house. I know what I owe on that house. I know what the payment for that house is. I know what the insurance for that house is. I know what the tax for that house is. I know what I own. I know what I owe. Third, I know how much I earn. And fourth, I know where everything I have goes. In our marriage, Rhonda and I, Rhonda's really the one who's great at the details. Because of that, I know the condition of my herd. I know what I own, what I owe, what I earn, where it goes. I know the things that happen in our life because we keep good records. And what it does at that point, it gives great 
marital intimacy because we have great financial intimacy. So second thing uh, the scripture teaches us about good financial stewardship, you got to know how to plan your spending. It's called a budget. How many know what a budget is? Yeah, uh, we do a budget every month. Rhonda and I go over the budget every month. Uh, we know how much we paid. We know how much we owe. Uh, and because of that, we have incredible intimacy. You know what the average credit card debt in America is? $7,900. So if that's the average, that means there are a lot above $7,900, and there's some below $7,900. By the way, let me give you some good news. 23% of Americans have no credit card debt. Wow. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? But you got to put a budget together, what you're spending. What happens in our culture, we live in a time where it's always about impulse buying. Has anybody tried to go buy a timeshare? You sit in a timeshare, and they want you to make a decision right then and there. You know, it's really, they put the screws on you. They want you to make a decision. Rhonda and I just... Uh, Thought we would go solar. You know, that's the, the, the real thing to do. If you care about the environment, you ought to go solar. Has anybody had one of the solar salesmen sit down at your kitchen table and talk to you why you need to go solar? By the way, is there any solar salesman in here this morning? I, I, I want to make sure I don't get in trouble, all right? But you have to make a decision, and it's all about the very moment. Impulse buying. You can't even go to McDonald's. But after you order your meal, they'll say something like, would you like to supersize that? Dude, if I wanted a large, I would have ordered a large. Or would you like to make a donation to the Children's Network? It's always about impulse. We live in a culture that tries to make you discontent with what you have. I, uh, I bought me a new riding lawnmower. Yeah, I did. We moved out from a gated community in South Tulsa to out in rural Oklahoma, and I got four acres. And uh, I, I knew I needed a, a new riding mower. You know, we men can justify why we need a, a new riding lawnmower, right, fellas? It's really not that hard. It's right there with the new bass boat that we all need. Um, but, but I sat there and did all the research that I could on the kind of mower that I wanted to take care of my property. And, uh, you know, I saw one I kind of liked, but it only went seven miles per hour. It only had a 3,200 hydro gear, and I need, I need something at least with a 3,400 hydro gear. So I did all my research, and I finally settled on a Bobcat. Bobcat, 61-inch, zero-turn mower uh, with 3,400 gears that mows up to 10 miles an hour. And I went and got that new seat on it, fellas. You know what I'm talking about, the air ride, so that when you go over the bumps, it's... Uh, now, if I could just get Rhonda to fall in love with my zero-turn mower as I am in love with my zero-turn mower. But when I went looking, there is, you would be shocked, the cost of a nice zero-turn commercial-grade mower. But it's worth spending the extra money, and all the men said, amen. I set a budget before I went in, so I knew what the limits were. I planned and I saved for over a year, but I knew what the budget was. I tell you what, it'll save you a lot. You know, Christmas is coming up, and the one thing you need to decide before Christmas gets here is how much you're going to spend on Christmas before Christmas gets here. And then it's really wonderful that when you've already set a budget with your spouse, when you sat in private and talked about this and you weren't under compulsion, that you knew exactly how much you were allowed to spend. And I tell you what, it really does a wonderful thing of helping you Avoid making impulsive decisions. God's Word says something about that. It says, 
The wise, in Proverbs 21, 20, the wise saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. So how do you break that habit? You set a budget. A budget is simply planned spending. How many of you have noticed in marriage, one loves to spend and the other likes to save? Don't raise your hand which one you are. But I am amazed that through 31 years of pastoral ministry, we'll sit down and it's about money. By the way, it's the number one issue that people claim is the reason for divorce in America. We don't have financial intimacy. And if we don't have financial intimacy, the enemy will make a big issue about it and destroy the intimacy in our relationships. But the idea that we don't live by a budget will lead us to falling into a trap where money becomes our God or acquiring things becomes our God instead of understanding things are a gift to us from God that allows us to serve Him, not for us to serve them. Three characteristics of a good budget. You ready? Here they are. One, it ought to be a mutual decision. If you're married, you ought to be sitting down with your spouse talking about your finances. Two, it ought to be a matter of prayer. You know what's going to happen when you start praying about your finances? God's going to change your appetite and desires. You're going to find out that you're not about acquiring things here on earth, which is important, but it's important about investing into the kingdom of God. It's investing in things that are going to last forever. Far outlive you. Thirdly, it should be based on biblical goals. Store up for yourselves treasures where? Not here on earth, but where? In heaven. How do you do that? That's why your foundation exists. We help people invest in eternity. How do you do that? Well, the thing that we've done in our will and our trust that Rhonda and I have set up when we leave this old world and go to the next, the first 10% of our estate is going to our local church. Do you realize your Nazarene Foundation gave away $10 million this past year that we distributed to Nazarene Ministries? Let me ask you, Pastor, if I was to ever call you and say, look, I don't know if you know this, but someone has left your church $100,000. Do you want it or not? We have never had a pastor get upset about calling them and letting them know if someone in their church is investing in the kingdom and it's going to make an eternal impact on somebody else's life. The beauty about the church that we give in such a way that we may not see the impact in the moment, but I got news for you. Your act of obedience investing in the kingdom is going to be the answer to somebody else's prayers in the future. We had three kids. Kristen, Lindsay, and Drew, and one of our goals was to get them through Nazarene schools debt-free and to make sure that mom and dad came out debt-free. They're called the Nortons. School teachers, husband, wife, no children. They left Tulsa Central, their entire estate. Nobody knew it because they lived so frugally. But they, lived, they left a $1.4 million estate to the church. And the pastor at that time used the million dollars as a lead gift to an educational wing of the church, which is wonderful. Tulsa Central is a church with 85,000 square feet under one roof. It has 36 air conditioning units. But they wanted a part of that put aside for academic scholarships for the kids raised at Tulsa Central when they went to college. My kids in the four years received $76,000 of scholarship money. They got $6,000 a year to going to Nazarene school. You got twice as much going to a Nazarene school versus the state school because they were big on Nazarene education. I got news. When I get to heaven, I'm looking up the Nortons. And I'm going to thank them 
that their investment in the kingdom was an answer to Rhonda and my prayer. Store up treasures in heaven. One of my dreams is that after our kids give the first 10% to our local church, we're dowing three scholarships for child sponsorship. They're $8,000 endowments. So when I leave this old world for an $8,000 endowment, I can endow a child until Jesus Christ returns. And I'm hoping I'll hear that. That when I'm in heaven, someone comes up to me. Again, I don't know how much time will expire, but heaven is at the absence of time. Heaven is the fullness of time. But I know time will have elapsed and we'll be there together in the presence of Jesus Christ. But I'm hoping to hear someone come to me and say, are you Stephen Lester? And I'll say, yes. And I want to thank you for sponsoring me. You have no idea who I was or who I am. I didn't get to receive this scholarship to after you'd been in heaven for 50 years. But I want you to know your sacrificial giving is the reason that I am in heaven today. I was fed. I was clothed. I was preached the gospel to because of your gift. Your Nazarene Foundation sets up endowments. For those who yet to hear, third principle, financial stewardship, and I'll be quick now. Contentment or enjoyment. You know, God wants you to enjoy what he blesses you with. Seriously, the, the poor worry about not having enough, and the rich always worry about not losing what they got. You know what I'm talking about? Worry, by the way, is really, the, the word is, is chokes the life out of you. You worry about things you cannot control, but God's word's clear. He wants you to enjoy what he has blessed you with. When you live above your means, that's called stealing. For instance, if you got $3,000 a month worth of income, but you have $4,000 a month worth of bills, that's called stealing. That will eventually catch up with you. When you live at the end of your means, you know what that is like? That that you have $5,000 worth of income and you have $5,000 worth of bills and that you cannot afford to miss one day of work because if you miss one day of work, guess what happens? You fall behind. That's called stress. But God doesn't want you to steal. God doesn't want you to be stressed. God wants you to live within, within your means, and that's called stewardship, and that's what, what creates financial peace. What do you do? What do you do with those things? You hold on to them. The world we live in, again, will do everything it can to steal your contentment. Next law. Law number four. Pull that up there for me. Law number four. Enjoyment, contentment. Page four. Law number four. Sharing, investing. Proverbs 11, 24, 25 says, One man gives, one man gives, and another, one man gives freely. And gains more. Sharing. One person who gives freely yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly leads to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. That's what Proverbs 11, 24, 25 says. That if you really want to enjoy life, then you need to be someone who's generous. That you not only take care of yourself, but you're able to take others. One of the biblical definitions of masculinity in, in the day and age in which we live, especially where masculinity is under attack, what that means, fellas, is that we not only make enough to take care of ourselves, but we also make enough to take care of our spouse and our family. We take that very, very seriously. Godly men want to provide for their families. Hmm. It's an investment. Let me help you. Uh, the first person or the first person you need to give to is the church. 
look at it here in moments, tithing. Second person you need to give to is your self. If you can't put away 10% or 15% uh, into long-term investments for the future, then I got news for you. You don't need the new Apple 15. Or you may not need that new John Deere tractor. Have you noticed John Deere green tractors are very expensive? Have you noticed that? Very nice. When I pastored the church in Estill Springs, one of the guys was a UAW guy from John Deere. And I, I told him, I, I said, I, I'd love to have John Deere. I just can't afford the green paint. And then what happened is um, I got me a John Deere, and I called him over. and said, I want you to see my John Deere. He was excited. I got a John Deere. And it was a John Deere weed eater. That's the nicest John Deere product I could afford. Investing. What or who are you investing? God's word said God so loved the world that he gave. Giving is a natural expression of of love. You can't give without loving, but you can't love without giving. Generosity is an expression of love. Proverbs 22:9 says, "A generous man will himself be blessed." And Proverbs 28:27 says, "He who gives to the poor will lack nothing." I didn't read the scripture but I, earlier that God says he takes this very personally. When you give to the poor, God takes that upon himself as a loan that you made on God's behalf. When you take care of those who cannot take care of themselves, I didn't say taking care of those who won't take care of themselves because that's a different law. That's a law of work. And every Christian, if you can, needs to be able to work. But he says in the Scripture, that what he wants you and I to do is to be generous with others. God acknowledges that, and God takes care of that. Law number five is called tithing. What? Yeah, Proverbs 3, 9, Honor the Lord with all your wealth, with the first fruit of all your crops. What is the purpose of tithing? Don't misunderstand me. Stewardship is not about amount. It's about attitude. Some of the harshest words that Jesus had for those on the face of the earth were the Pharisees. Great tithers. Gave down to the very final grain of salt. Pay their 10%. But God's word is so clear. That it's not about amount as it is about attitude. Here's what I find people who are madly in love with Jesus Christ. Giving him the first 10% is not the maximum. That's just the starting point. And Christians who fall in love with Jesus Christ and his kingdom want to give and give and give because they love Jesus Christ. They're generous. God says you want to show that, uh, prove that I exist. Go to Malachi chapter 3. You have that? Malachi 3. Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you in tithes and offering? You're under a curse. You're a whole nation because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, and there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. The only part of Scripture that says this is how you can prove that God exists, you got to put him first. I've known people who've gotten right with the Lord, and when we talk about 
financial stewardship and that you have to put God first, that this was always a hang-up because the very moment they began to tithe, week one, the car breaks down. Week two, the uh, stove goes down. And, and they'll say, it, it doesn't work. I said, well, let God work these things out. You put him first and, and prove that he exists because suddenly when you tithe, they're not your problems anymore, they're his. And then God's got to clean up the mess. Because you're not living for the glory of money. You're living for the glory of God. And I got news for you. Every money, every dollar bows at the throne of Jesus Christ. So what are you going to do? When you tithe, it does three things. One, it shows him you're grateful for the past. That you trust him for what he's done. It says something about the present that you trust him to provide exactly what you need. And third, it says you trust him with the future. Biblical stewardship is simply trusting a God who says he's not only going to take care of you here on earth, but he's going to take care of you throughout eternity in heaven. If you can't trust him to take care of you in the temporary, how in the world are you ever going to trust him to take care of you throughout eternity? He says, prove me. The world says, when we give things away, we, we, we have less. God's word says, the more you obey me, the more you listen to me, the more I will pour through you. Your receiving is in direct proportion and you're willing to give it away. If you're willing to give it away, he's willing to bless you to use you as a conduit. Remember again, financial stewardship is not about increasing my standard of living. Everybody who's listening to my voice, by the world standards, everybody in here is filthy rich. You got a washer and dryer? You do know the vast majority of the world would love to have a washer and dryer in the home. You have indoor plumbing? Anybody got indoor plumbing? Do you know a lot of the world has, they would love to have indoor plumbing. There's a reason that many people are coming across our southern border every day. There's a reason because the things here that we take for granted, the rest of the world would love to have. Are you going to trust him? Our grandparents' home, come praise team. They had a, uh, for their water source, you had to uh, go out in the back porch and prime the pump. How many old-timers remember what it's like to prime the pump? And what would happen after you got your drink, you would always leave water with a necessary volume after you got drinking that you were satisfied so that the person behind you could have a drink. Tithing is what you leave behind so the person who comes behind you let me ask you do you trust him? Some of us our lives are in a financial mess. Some of us have a marriage that our finances were so far under, we think there's no hope. I got news for you. That is a lie from hell. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and willing to put him first and finding someone who can help mentor you through these problems, there's not a person here who cannot be helped if you'll follow Jesus and put him in charge. 
Do you believe that? People's lives are wrecked because they worry about money. Because we really don't trust God to take care of us. It's time to quit giving God lip service and start trusting him that we believe he is a God who will keep his promises to us if we'll simply give it to him. Bow your head, close your eyes. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being with us this morning. This is not a time of discouragement. This is a time of encouragement. The beauty of your word is that it speaks directly to us. And today, we have preached your word. So, Lord God, if we're here this morning and today is a day of affirmation, that we've been spiritually doing the things that your word says, and because of that, we are at peace financially. I say hallelujah. Help us to tell others that you can be trusted and that you are a God who really does keep his promises. And if we're here and we feel like we're drowning in debt, Help us to seek someone who can help us. Help rescue us from the things that the devil wants to destroy us with. You cannot serve both God and money. If money becomes our God, we will drown. But if you, God, are our God, then we will invest in a place where rust, moth, and dust cannot destroy. Help us to invest in your eternal kingdom. For it's in your name, Jesus, the God who supplies all our needs. It's in your name we pray. And all of God's kids said,
Father, thank you for never leaving us or forsaking us. Would you continue to meet with us? Would you continue to speak to us? Father, as we leave this place, uh, would we be good, a good representation of you? And um, Lord, may we just share our hearts with people this week and tell them about the real Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you.